Thank you so much again, Ted, for having me. It's such an honor. It's a privilege to have any association with you. You are just um, someone I really, really admire and look up to a lot. So, What's up, everybody? It's Ted Carr here with Leah Vitali. And today we're going to be talking about what do you do with your money once you start earning it as an entrepreneur? There's a lot of great trainings out there teaching you how to actually make the money but what do you do with it once you get it? There's not too much training about that. So today's module, today's class is gonna be all about what to do with the money once you get it. Leah, welcome. Thank you so much, Ted. I'm so happy to be here and honored. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're in this really unique position where you help people make more money with the money that they're bringing in. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't have to be entrepreneurs, right? You help, you know, single moms, single dads, families, like, teenagers, I'm sure, elderly people, like people of all shapes and sizes, you help them uh, make more money with their income. So how do you do that? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of investing. I'm working in the traditional financial services industry, but specifically I'm a licensed insurance broker, life insurance and health insurance. And um, I, I actually help people invest a lot in, in life insurance. It's kind of one of the best kept secrets of the wealthy. So that's a big, that's a definitely a big investment vehicle that is really popular, popular amongst a lot of my clients. And it's interesting you say that because from personal experience, when I started making good money with my courses, I started to get stressed out about what do I do with this money? It's just like sitting here It's just like, not doing anything. It was actually stressing me out. And so what I did is I called up a few of my, well, well, the wealthiest friends I have and like people who are doing millions. And I'm like, Hey man, this might sound weird, but like, what do you do with your money? Where do you, where do you invest it? Where do you put it? What should I do with my money? And they all gave me more or less the same advice. But one of the key pieces of advice that they all had in common was they all put it into some form of life insurance, mm -hmm. even multiple types of life insurance. And they yep. were like big on that. And so it's cool if you could just talk on that, let us know a bit about what is life insurance or health insurance. What's the difference between the two and yeah. maybe like why someone would want to invest in that versus, versus investing in like real estate or let's say gold or silver. Mm -hmm. Awesome question. So life insurance is what it sounds like. Like most people hear life insurance and they think I die and my family gets a check. And that is totally true. It's not like, you know, it's not like some buzzword for something else. It's actually life insurance. But what most people don't know is that as the industries evolved over the years, life insurance can actually be used also for cash accumulation. So like you said, there's multiple different types of life insurance. There's term life, which is, okay, I'm going to give you a quick little breakdown. There's two main subcategories of life insurance. There's term and there's permanent. So the best analogy I can use to describe the difference is basically renting versus owning your home. So when you rent your house, right, you pay rent for usage of the space, you have a lease. While you pay rent with, during the contract, you get to live there, but you don't own anything, but you have a roof over your head, you have shelter. And then when your lease is up, you move out, you don't take anything with you. You, some would say you threw your money away, but others would say, no, you were paying for a place to live and you didn't have any of the liabilities of a homeowner and all of that, right? So that's like term insurance. Term insurance works just like that. You usually have a contract. It might be 10, 20, 30 years. You pay a premium. And during the contract period, if you die within the term of your contract, your family gets a check. But if you outlive your contract by like even a day, you are moving out of your policy. You don't carry anything with you. There's no equity and um, you don't have any more coverage. And actually insurance companies, I think, make most of their money through term policies because most people don't die in the term, right? So, but it's still good to have, like, especially if you're a family, you have young children, you want protection. And the benefit of term is it's a lot cheaper than permanent insurance. It's very affordable. So you could get like a five, if you're in your 20s or 30s, you get like a $500,000 term policy for like maybe 30 bucks a month, right? So it's very, very affordable. Yeah. 
So then there's permanent insurance, which is more like paying a mortgage. So here, you know, when you pay a mortgage, you're paying towards the equity of the house. And, and then once you've paid it off, you own this asset now that has value. So permanent insurance works the same way. Your premiums, yes, they are covering the death benefit. They're covering the life insurance cost, but um, they're also building equity. They're actually accumulating into a cash account inside of a life insurance policy that's growing with interest um, as long as you're paying into it. And so this is what a lot of people are using now for supplemental retirement, just for like future investments, because you can access the money that is inside life insurance policy. And there's a lot of very creative ways of using that and a lot of benefits to it as well. So that's like a just very general rundown. Well, I didn't know the different, I didn't know there was two, two differences there. Mm -hmm. um, so the way to actually make money with life insurance, which most people aren't maybe even aware of, is to do the, sorry, there's the term one, and what's the other one? Permanent. The permanent one. The way to make money with it is with the permanent one. Is that correct? Exactly. And so the way that works, correct me if I'm wrong, is you pay into it instead of 30 bucks a month, it's more like, I don't know, let's say 300 a month or more. Mm -hmm, exactly. but, then, but then say 10 or 20 years later, you can pull that money out. And when you pull that money out, you're now getting more than you put in. Is that correct? Exactly, because it's growing with interest. And it accounts for inflation. Yeah. So, you know, depending, every life insurance company is different and they all have different um, accounts you can invest into inside of the policy. So you could invest more aggressively, more conservatively, just like you would maybe in a traditional brokerage account. But the benefit, and so yes, it definitely outpaces inflation. Like a lot of the you know, sort of the averages would be, you know, 8%. If, if inflation's 3%, you're more than outpacing it, right? Um, but the other huge benefit, and this is really why it's become so popular, like why do this instead of investing in a mutual fund, right? Or, or, or in something or, else. Or gold or real estate. Exactly. So this is usually what we would refer to as like a safe bucket, right? So real estate's great. Commodities are great. There's nothing wrong with them, but everything carries with it its own risk. In life insurance, um, you, you know, first of all, life insurance companies are known to be some of the most stable and, and, and reliable um, organizations. Like even in 2008, when the market crashed and all of these companies were folding, the insurance companies were unscathed. Like they were totally cool, right? So that's one thing. But the other thing is that the money that grows inside of life insurance is actually not taxable. That's the real, um, that's the real kicker. That's why it's become so popular is that there's a, a legal loophole. It's, there's actually an IRS code. It's called IRC 7702, if anyone wants to look it up. And it says that within the shelter of a life insurance policy, you're allowed to save and invest money tax deferred, which means later, but then you're allowed to access your money in the form of policy loans tax free. So basically, that's a very fancy way of saying that the money that you put in a life insurance policy grows with interest without taxes. And the reason why that's so significant is there's pretty much no other investment that at least a wealthy person would be able to qualify for where they can put unlimited contributions without paying taxes, right? Like you do have things like a Roth IRA, um, but those have uh, those have caps, like your income is capped in a Roth. You can't make more than like $120,000 a year to be able to invest into a Roth. And even if your income is below that, you can only contribute about 6,000 a year. So less than, it's about 500 a month. So if you wanna, you know, really reach financial independence, financial freedom, you're gonna need to save a lot more aggressively than that. And it won't just, it won't even allow you to do that at least in a tax advantaged way. Right. So. The way I see it now, after speaking with you a few times about it, is life insurance, the, the permanent one, it's like, okay, I'm gonna spend, again, let's just, let's just use this basic example. I'm gonna, from now, let's say I'm 30, now until, let's say I'm 60, so 30 years, I'm gonna put a thousand bucks a month away. Mm -hmm. So, 
the math approximately, I don't know, is maybe 350 grand or something. Mm -hmm. Thousand bucks a, a, a year for 30 years. Say it's 350 grand. But when I'm 60, not only am I going to be able to pull out that 350 grand, I'm going to be able to pull out like potentially like 900 grand. Exactly. And it won't be all at once, right? It won't be like a big lump sum, but it'll be like, okay, from ages 60 to 80, let's say, I can pull out like, I don't know, let's say six grand a month or something. Yep. Yeah. And the, the other cool thing about it that you're reminding me about to mention is like, yes, you can do it that way where you're taking it out monthly throughout retirement. And that would be probably the best way to maximize your investment, like to basically get the most, the most, um, the most juice out of it, right. The most bang for your buck. But one of the other very attractive features of investing in life insurance is that you don't actually have any sort of like requirements on when you must take it out or when you um, can't leave it in too long. Cause for example, let's say you wanted to put money into a traditional retirement plan, like a 401k or an IRA. So the IRS doesn't actually allow you to touch that money until you turn 59 and a half years old. So if you wanted to take it out earlier, you're not going to be allowed to without paying taxes and penalties. Where, whereas with the life insurance, you can actually access it whenever you want. So you have accessibility even earlier. Like let's say you wanted to take out a lump sum when you're 50, you can do that and you won't pay any penalty to do that, um, which is really, really cool. But yeah, you can also leave it in longer, take it out in distributions. You could take it out in one lump sum, however you like. It's very versatile and flexible. Right. And just like the longer it stays in, the more I make. But I could potentially, let's say, 30 now, I put a thousand bucks in for the next 30 years. When I'm 60, I could potentially pull it all out. Yeah. Right? All at once in, in lump sum. The one caveat to that is you want to leave a little bit in so that your policy doesn't close or lapse because if it closes, what happens is now the IRS doesn't treat it as a life insurance policy anymore. They treat it as an investment because they see, oh, okay, they were, there we go. So you want to leave enough equity in there so that your account remains active. So that's the loophole. Yes, that is definitely part of it for sure. That's part of it. Cool. But okay. uh, you mentioned real estate investors. A lot of like real estate investors love these too because you can actually use your life insurance policy basically becoming your own bank and you can finance your own investments. So let's say you had, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars cash value, you could borrow from it, go flip a property, make a profit and go put it back and you don't have to pay the bank interest to finance your loan. That's crazy. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. So I guess the, the thing I like about the, the thing I like about this is compared to stocks or even gold and silver, for example, is that sure. Historically they say, you know, real estate's always gone up. Gold's always gone up. Uh, stocks have always gone up. Right. But they definitely do go up and down. Right. Sure. But it's, it's like this, usually not hundred percent, but it's like this every now and then the one fucking plummets and you're they're done. Right. But with life insurance, it's not really like that. Right. Life insurance. There is no up and down. So life insurance, like put it in here, get it out of here. What's the guarantee on that? Okay. So really good question. So, so term and permanent are the subgroups, but within permanent, there's even more subgroups, which is the different ways your money can grow. So you can have, um, a whole life policy, which is barely going to grow at all. That's more for like, if you just want to guarantee death benefits, somebody who's more focused on protecting their family. But if you're looking at it more from the cash value perspective, then you'd probably be investing in universal life policies. And that's what I do a lot of. Within universal life, you have variable universal life and indexed universal life. So variable universal life is basically like, investing in the stock market where you do the ups and the downs and the heart attacks, but maybe big gains, right? But then the index is what you're describing because we've talked about this before, is where you actually have a floor and you have a ceiling. So what that would look like, for example, one of the carriers that we work with a lot, your money's capped at 15%, but you have a floor of 0.75. So what that means is that anything below 0.75, if the market crashes and does minus 10 this year, your account gets 
0.75. And anything between 0.75 and 15, you get what it is. Anything beyond 15, you're capped at 15. So that allows you, and that's why this is more of like a safe way. So hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if the market goes down 10%, mm -hmm. you still get, you still go up 0.75. Exactly. You still gain. Yeah. So you, you have cool. principal protection. So you can't lose, but you still get market participation. You still grow, right? right? So that's where you have- That's the you guarantee. Get, yeah, and the truth is, and I should say this because this is a recording and whatever, technically none of this is a guarantee. Like life insurance companies don't guarantee any of this. This is all projections, hypothetical, but they can back their performance up based on the last 20, 30 years. And assuming that there isn't an apocalypse and the entire financial industry doesn't turn upside down, you know, there's like a 99.999% chance that everything okay. that so we're saying is going to happen. Would you say from what you've seen, what you've experienced and what you know, would you say that it's like the safest investment? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's the safety of the indexed option combined with the tax advantage that just makes it a really attractive option because it's the only one that I'm aware of that will offer you both of those things combined. And if you compare a life insurance policy compared to pretty much any other traditional investment over a long period of time, like 15 years or more, because of those two aspects, the life insurance policy will outperform everything else hands down every single time. Right. Wow. So why do you think, why do you think it's, it's, it's not as popular as stocks or real estate or gold and silver or cryptocurrency? You know, I don't know exactly, but I do know that typically the, the insurance companies are targeting very high net worth um, clientele. In fact, the company that I'm brokered with is very unusual in the fact that we offer the same products and services that are normally reserved for the top 2% to like the 98%. Usually there's barriers to entry to even have access to these products. They're targeting a, a more affluent clientele. So I would say that's for sure one reason why it's not more um, you know, well-known. Like the average client for one of our platinum providers that we work with, the average client outside of my brokerage is investing three grand a month, right? So the average, you know, middle-class American doesn't have that to invest, you know, after all of their expenses and everything else. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of who their target market normally is. Got it. What would be the minimum someone could invest? Like, let's say they're part of that 98% and they want to be on like the same kind of index fund that you call it that index fund mm -hmm. they want they want to be on the same index fund as the top two percent what's the minimum they could put in like 10 bucks a month five bucks a month 30 bucks a month um so there's very there's a lot of variables it depends on their age and their health too because it is life insurance so they're going to get rated um so it it wants to make financial sense but like i would say assuming they're young and healthy as little as even like 50 bucks a month um it wouldn't probably make sense for like less than that i'd have to run numbers but usually like the on the low end of my clients it's like a hundred would be like the low end i've done 50 dollars a month for like child policies i just did one of those this week for someone who wants to use it for like a college savings for her child but for an adult, for it to really make financial sense and for them to have something to show for themselves later, then, you know, I wouldn't really usually go under a hundred. So over the course of a year, 1200 bucks. Mm -hmm. And then let's say putting 1200 bucks a month in. No, a year, 1200 bucks a year for 20 years. That's, I don't know, 25 grand, 24 grand. Mm -hmm. I've, don't know what the math is, but approximately, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so that would be, let's do it. So yeah, like 12,000 in a decade, right? So that would be 36,000 over 30 years. Over 30 years, what would it be in 20 years? 20 years would be 24, right? Oh, sweet, okay. Yeah. So let's say they put in the 36 grand over the course of 
30 years. Off the top of your head, ballpark, roughly, what could they expect to pull out? If they're young, like that's more, I would do a hundred a month more for like someone in their young, early twenties, right? So if they're young, let's say they have 30, 40 years for it to grow. Um, this is so off the top of my head. Don't quote yeah, me on right. this, but oh. I feel like, you know, it's not going to be a full retirement. That might be like supplemental. Maybe they could take out 15 to 20,000 a year for 20 years in retirement, something like that. If they're very young, early, early twenties. So you know, I would, hold on, hold on, hold on, because they only put in 36 grand. Oh yeah. It's much more than what they put in for sure. So the they younger put, they, they are. 36, they put in 36 over the course of, let's say 30 years. Mm -hmm. What would their um, total net worth inside of that fund be then? At the 30 year mark, yeah. it might be like, oh my God, I'm just guessing. I don't yeah, want to make totally, stuff up. Totally guess. Um, All part. Yeah, like let's say it's double or triple what they put in, but okay. then as, if they leave it in longer and they take it in just annual distributions, they could stretch it out even long, even more and Got maybe it. get another, you know, so maybe instead of it being double, they could triple it in Got if it. they left it in. Okay. So yeah. It's, it's almost a for sure thing that it would double. Oh, yeah. Especially if they're starting that young. Yeah, that's like a no-brainer. When you say that young, you mean like 18, 20 years old? Yeah, I'm thinking like early 20s. You know, for, if you're in your 30s, you really want to be saving more. In fact, I'm trying to find, I have this awesome, I'm trying to find, I have this awesome illustration that shows if you want to have a million dollars by the time you turn 65, how, how much you would have to put in each month. And I just, what we'll do Leah, is at the end of this, I'll edit it and I'll stick yeah. your little cool. training to the end of this. So you guys, if you want to watch to the end, Leah, we'll do a demonstration showing you how your money can, can work for you. How's that? Yeah, no, that's perfect. I would love to. Okay, cool. So Leah, let, let's switch gears a bit and talk about behind the scenes. Okay. So, you sell this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So do you make, um, you not only sell this stuff, but you also train people to sell this stuff, mm -hmm. right? So you're, 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 you got like three prongs going on. You've got the one prong <laughs> where like you're helping people get rich or richer by making their money do stuff. Yes. And with the other prong where it's like you yourself make commission when someone buys life insurance from you. Yes. And with the other prong where you're helping other people sell the stuff so that they can not only help other people get richer, but they in themselves can make money selling it too. Yes. Right? So those are your three prongs? Yes. Okay. Now. <laughs> My no, prongs. No, you, you were not always selling this stuff. You had to learn it from scratch right? mm -hmm. i'm working your story about how you, you met your mentor and he showed you the ropes right mm -hmm. and you've been doing this for how long how many years five and a half five and a half years so like six years ago you didn't really have a clue what this world was about right not at all not at all and now this is like is it your full-time income mm -hmm. this is all you do mm -hmm. and you're like you're like a big shot now right you said tomorrow, like, you got like <laughs> You got like a Zoom call tomorrow. You said you're you're hosting a Zoom call with like 300 reps. Are those are those reps like all part of your company or? or They're the, all part of my company. Yeah. The organization that you're a part of. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Now, if somebody wanted to get into selling life insurance, mm -hmm. like you do, can you tell us a bit about what that would look like? Like, what mm -hmm. would average day in life look like if someone was to do your job or at least yeah. started doing your job totally yeah so um well you know it's definitely it's learning a, a bunch of new things right so first of all you have to get an insurance license because it would be illegal to offer life insurance without one so that's the first step and um you know when i recruit people into my agency i actually have a licensing coordinator that holds their hand through that process because otherwise it could be a little just sort of abstract of what to do. So we walk our agents through that whole process from A to Z. They do an online study course. It's really not that hard to pass. Like uh, in the state of California, you need a 60 to pass, which is a D. 
<laughs> so, so we have a joke that D's earn degrees in our industry. Um, so that that's just basically the piece of paper though that allows you to sell the products. You don't really gonna learn how to do it in that way. You don't really learn, you know, that's very just like industry knowledge. Then the second way that we train our new associates coming on is we have classroom training. So kind of like how you have for the Course Creator Academy, you know, weekly, every, actually every day you have something, right? So we have stuff almost daily as well. Um, some is mindset, some is, you know, concept and theory of some of the products, case studies. We do a lot of case studies because we'll show like a before and after of a family, you know, before we met them and after, those are fun. Um, and then also some is just skill set. So we do like drill practice rehearse where we're role playing uh, scripts and how to make phone calls and all that kind of stuff. Cool. So those, those are cool. And then the last way we train our associates, and this is really like, I think the most powerful is we do on the job training. We do an actual field like hand holding experience where we'll have one of our new new trainees get on a call with one of us and someone they know like a friend who's willing to help them and we'll actually do like a whole mock presentation cool. with the, in that trusted safe setting so that they can get just mm -hmm. real life hands-on experience and so by the time someone's seen five ten of those meetings they're they're pretty much good to go yeah nice 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 um and then just out of curiosity, let's say I am a broker, as you call it. Mm -hmm. Or an agent. Yeah. Or an agent. A broker is more someone who has a team. An agent is, you know, someone who's just like selling products. Okay. So let's say I'm an agent and I have a call today with John. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to sell John on some life insurance. <laughs> Do I record that Zoom call? With his permission. Yeah. And then do I do I send that recording to you to review or someone on the team to review to give me feedback on it? You could, but normally you would actually have me there and I would shadow you so that I could, you know, course correct you as you go. So to make you, sure. Okay. So, so that it's not, it's not common practice in your field or your industry, at least in your organization, it's not common practice to review zoom calls. Not really like it. There wouldn't be a reason why you couldn't do it. It's just normally we'll have the, the trainer actually there present for the appointment. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, and then, so if somebody wants to start selling life insurance, what's the difference between life insurance and health insurance? So in, in my company, the only reason we have the health license is because and I didn't really even get into this, but some of the permanent products and actually even some of the term products have um, what are called riders that can be attached to the policies. And so one of the way, one of the riders you could have attached would be long-term care, right? So long-term care is basically, um, you know, more our parents age usually when they start, if they have become ill or, or injured and they're not able to really care for themselves as they need to go into a nursing home or something, mm -hmm. who pays for that? Right. Cause right. that the average long-term care cost is like 70 grand a yeah. year today. And if you don't have long-term care, then you're, you could completely liquidate your whole retirement, just paying for, for a nurse. So a lot of the life insurance policies have long-term care riders that you can attach to them so that you have the death benefit if the person dies, you have the cash value if they live, and then you also have the long-term care if they live, but they need right care so, good. so the health license lets you do that and that's really smart to do especially if you know that in your family there's the likelihood of cancer or heart attacks or dementia right mm -hmm. like it's really smart to get that set up i would, I would think oh yeah unfortunately yeah. it's one of those things that a lot of times people just don't do they don't see the value in until someone in their family needs it. And then you can't qualify for it anymore. How, how do you qualify? Do you got to run on a treadmill for how you want to run or? So all of these products, the life as well as long-term care, you have to apply for. And they do, uh, this is where it's good to be vegan, by the way. Vegans get the advantage here because you get, um, they do a full paramedic exam. So they do your blood, they do your urine, um, height, weight. They, they just do a full workup. They actually gather all of your medical records. They also gather your driving records. They basically want to make sure that you're not high risk, that you're not going to, drop dead tomorrow Sweet. Sweet. right 
So very cool. Um, very cool. Yeah. Okay, so practical steps. Uh, let's let's discuss two practical steps right now before we wrap up. Number one, how would someone go about buying some life insurance today with you? So I have a um, I have I can I have a calendar booking link. They can just go to booklea.com and they just put in their email address and then they get can you, can instant. You spell that yes. out. Yes. B o o k. Mm hmm. L e i a. Dot com, and that gets them straight access to my um, calendar, so they can just book a call with me right there. And I don't charge anything because, as you said, I make money in commission. So I only make money if I'm able to actually help the person implement a plan that yeah. works for them. Okay. Yeah. So booklay.com. That's how you get started. Yep. And. How do they get started with wanting to sell life insurance? Mm, um, that is awesome. So I would say, I'm trying to think, because I have my webinar, but I don't want to give them that whole link right now. Hey, can they go to booklay.com as well? Yeah, that works. Yeah. They can also DM me on Instagram. My handle is at Leia Vitali. And, um, you know, or they can email me, Leia at LeahVitali.com. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, sweet. So that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. Just get in contact with you and you'll help them either get potentially get started with investing or potentially get started with selling the stuff. Um, Absolutely. It would be my pleasure and my honor. Yeah, sweet. And I forgot to mention at the start of the video, I'll have to put like a text on the screen, but none of what we said today is financial advice. <laughs> no. And Not at all. regarding the vegan stuff, none of this is medical advice. <laughs> These are just, um, you know, thoughts and ideas and experiences around uh, yes. life insurance and potential investments that, yes. that, uh, that have no guarantees. Exactly. So very cool. Very cool. Well, that pretty much answered all of my questions. Let me check my notes. Uh, no, that's it. We covered everything. Awesome. All right. Well, I wanted to just take a moment and share with you guys some hypothetical scenarios, some illustrations um, based on, you know, the interview that you just watched with Ted and I talking about investing in life insurance, because I know that sounded maybe kind of abstract and some of you are probably wanting to see something a bit more tangible. So um, I have some different numbers that I'm going to share with you right now, which are pretty, pretty cool. So let's just get into presentation mode. Okay, so I based all of these on a 30 year old male because I know Ted is a healthy vegan 30 year old male. Um, so, and I'm sure probably a lot of his followers are in the same sort of age range, but it's not limited to a 30 year old male. Um, so of course, you know, your age and gender can be different and we can talk about that. All right, so this is a scenario of a 30 year old male who's actually just investing a lump sum right up front of $250,000. So he's doing it in $50,000 increments over the course of a five year period. So from age 31 through age 35, he invests $250,000. Now you can see on this far right here that he actually has a $2.4 million death benefit as well. So if God forbid, in after the first day of the life of his policy, if he were to pass away and he'd invested that first 50 grand, his family would receive a check for 2.4 million tax free. So this is um, still life insurance. Okay. But you're we're, the reason we're really here is we want to see, okay, well, what's this going to, how's my money going to work for me inside of the account, right? Like we talked about. So He's young, his money's just growing and growing, nothing to see here. But if you get all the way to retirement age, um, you can see at retirement age, he's able to access, this is of course hypothetical, but he's able to access approximately $118,824 per year for 20 years in retirement. So 66 all the way through age 85 for a total of 2.376 million tax free. So he puts in 250, he cashes out 2.3 million tax free, almost 10 times the return. And again, just like I said, you know, in the interview, keep in mind, this is all tax free, right? So it, even if let's say you were investing this money in a 401k or an IRA and a traditional retirement plan, if you were to access $118,000 a year, 
in those vehicles, those would be pre-tax, which means you'd have to pay taxes on that 118,000. Whereas here, because this is after tax dollars growing tax-free, this is a tax-free distribution for you to, to take in retirement. Okay, so that's um, a pretty cool example, but not all of us have a $250,000 lump sum. So I'm gonna move on to the next example, which is a 30 year old male investing $1,500 a month. This is actually like a really great number. Um, if you have this kind of discretionary income, if you're in your early thirties, as you'll see here, it will work beautifully for you throughout your life. Um, so same idea, this is a 30 year old male. And here that he's investing $1,500 a month or $18,000 per year. And he also has the death benefit, as you guys can see on the far right, it's an $860,000 life insurance policy. So if he lives, he has all the cash for his lifetime. If he passes, his family gets that payout. But we're here, we're really interested in the cash. So you can see moving on to retirement age. So by the time he's 65, he's contributed, he's invested a total of $630,000. This is what he's invested out of pocket over the course of 35 years of saving. And starting at age 66, he's able to access approximately $175,000 a year for 20 years in retirement again, totally tax-free. So he puts in 630, he's cashing out 3.5 million tax-free. So now I think you guys are starting to be able to see, wow, like the power of this vehicle and what it can do. Um, now I'm gonna show you kind of another cool example. So a lot of you guys might not even have $1,500 a month. You might just be able to have a few hundred dollars that you can put together, which is fine. And as we discussed in the interview, you know, this vehicle is typically reserved for high net worth clientele. However, one of the things that's unique about the company that I work with is that we're actually, you know, providing access and education and these exams, same products and services to you know, the 98%. So the exact same vehicle I just showed you guys, you can actually invest as little as a hundred or 200 or $300 a month. So I'm showing you now a 30 year old male investing 300 a month. So it's not going to look as sexy. I'm warning you ahead of time, but it's still, you know, um, you can see it really, your money really works for you anyway. So as a 30 year old male um, doing $300 a month, that's $3,600 a year. You have a death benefit of 163,000. Now we wanna, we wanna see what the cash is gonna do for us in retirement. So by retirement age at age 65, this individual would have invested $126,000. Starting at age 66, he'd be able to cash out approximately $32,000 a year for 20 years, tax-free, which is a total accumulation of $655,680 tax free. So he puts in 126, cashes out 655, right? So almost, uh, what is that? Septupled his investment, um, which is really, really cool. Now you might be thinking, yeah, I can't really live on 30 grand a year. And that's a legitimate you know, consideration. And so that's why you want to obviously save as much as you re realistically and comfortably can save. Um, and I'm actually going to show you a little chart at the end of this to give you an idea of kind of where you should be to be on target to be financially independent. So now this, I just wanted to show this for the contrast because it's so crazy. Same amount of money, 300 a month, but you can see whoa, what the extra time does for that money. So hopefully you guys will see the takeaway that the younger you start, the better because your money has compounding interest working in your favor. So this is someone, a parent, you know, theoretically, who's saving $300 a month on behalf of their two-year-old child. So you can actually open these policies up for children. I actually have one on each of my kids as college you know, accounts for them. So totally, we do this all the time. So this is a two-year-old who's investing, we're, we're investing $300 a month on behalf of a two-year-old. So right off the bat, they have a $571,000 death benefit. And this is just gonna keep growing and growing and growing and growing for a lot of years. So it's actually 62 years um, that this money is growing. So in total, the out-of-pocket investment is 223,000. Now you can see starting at age 65, this baby who's now an adult would be able to access $182,000 per year for 20 years in retirement. So 
we put in $220,000 on behalf of this baby and our money has grown to 3.8 million tax free. So, I mean, how would you, how would you feel if your parents had set one of these up for you and you knew you'd have close to 4 million tax free set aside for your future? Like what an amazing way to create legacy. So um, I just wanted to show you guys for the contrast, so you can see the difference, same investment, but for a two-year-old, you walk away with almost 4 million versus starting at age 30, you only have like 600,000. So really big difference. Okay. Now you might be wondering, okay, well, what's a reasonable amount of money for me to invest? So this is just a, a powerful infographic. I can see, you know, I think it shows the cost of waiting. So this is an infographic illustrating how much money you'd want to be investing per month based on how many years you have towards your retirement goal. So for instance, if you want to retire at 65, and you're 30, that means you have 35 years till retirement. So you would see under the 35 column here, it says you'd probably want to invest $435 a month. That's assuming you have an 8% interest rate, right? So this is a really good uh, gauge and it should hopefully disturb you a little bit as you, as you look here, like just five years later, if you have, if you only have 30 years till retirement, now you need to be saving $670 a month, right? Like another substantial amount, substantially higher. Um, if you only have 25 years till retirement. So, you know, let's say you're 40 years old and you want to retire at 65, you'd have to save a thousand bucks a month. And this mind you is only for you to achieve, you know, a million dollars, right? And a million dollars isn't really very much. Assuming that you have 20 years in retirement, a million dollars saved would allow you to live the lifestyle of $50,000 in today's dollars. And if we're calculating inflation now too, right? So inflation on 30, 40 years from now, 50 grand a year isn't going to be worth very much. So you probably want to have more than a million dollars saved um, for your retirement. But these are all the types of questions that we can calculate together, you know, in a call. So um, I don't charge. I, ha I don't have a sitting fee. I don't have any fee to work with me. So I just would love to sit down with you. Feel free to book a call with me. Like Ted said in the interview at booklea.com, we can do a full financial strategy for you. Identify if this is a suitable option option for you because it isn't a one size fits all, you know, you do have to medically qualify. It is meant to be a long-term investment. So there are many considerations to keep in mind. Um, but assuming it's suitable, then I'd love to help you guys implement something like this. All right. So hope you got some value from this. Thank you so much again, Ted, for having me. It's such an honor. It's a privilege to have any association with you. You are just um, someone I really, really admire and look up to a lot. So, all right. Have a wonderful day, guys. Talk to you soon.